Dr. Doxter, I have a blank check or an introduction. Take your pick. The introduction will be worth a lot more, I promise you. Uh, we've, been, we've been at the table having a really interesting conversation. You're, you're all going to love this. Uh, Dr. Mark, Mark Doxter is Chief Economist and Director of Research for the Real Estate Center at Texas A&M University and College Station. All right, now we got all the whooping crap out of the way. I will tell you that he earned his PhD in the Department of Finance at the University of Texas. Okay, so I had to get that in there. He also served as Associate Professor of Real Estate and Finance at Wichita State University for 10 years. As Chief Economist, he's currently doing market research to monitor how global and national trends are likely to impact residential and commercial real estate. Markets. He's been with the Real Estate Center since August 1997, published numerous articles, given over 1,050 presentations, more than 165,000 people. His research findings and comments have been published in the Wall Street Journal, Money Magazine, USA Today, just had a quote in there, I believe yesterday in USA Today, and Business Week, and was a guest on the Jim Lehrer News Hour on PBS, if you remember that. So it is my honor to introduce Dr. Mark Gosser. Thanks a lot, gosh, it's great to be here with a bunch of business people. Uh, I spent my life with business people. I've done almost 1,100 of these now, uh, three a week, all over the country. I can tell you, I don't care if you're a Republican or Democrat, people are, are tired of what's going on. There's a consensus in the country that what we're doing is wrong, we're on the wrong path. Everybody's figured it out. That's the only good news I have is that a year ago, People were completely ignorant to what was going on in our country, and they're not anymore. I kind of think maybe we need to do this about every 90 days. Have a debt ceiling crisis every 90 days to tell people, look, here's how this works. These are little trial runs. I come from Kansas, which I have tornado warnings. There's sirens on Monday. Monday at noon, the siren goes off, and you kind of do a little run through about what do you do if a big tornado comes, all right? This is a tornado drill. The siren is blowing. You're seeing what it's going to be like for a real one coming down the road if we keep this up. And everybody knows it now. Here's the problem, see? I used to blame politicians for this, but I figured it out now because I watch the polls, I've talked to people, I've listened to people respond to me. The problem isn't the politicians we have in Washington, D.C. The problem is the voters. The problem is you and me and everybody else. We at College Station, we send our guy or girl to Washington, D.C. to do what? Bang the pinata, steal all the candy, bring it home to College Station. We got a $40 million contract for a health center or whatever. Re-elect me again so I can go back and bang the pinata and bring more candy to you. So Charleston, South Carolina. They got tea party guys and gals, and they got other kinds of guys and gals, and and uh, the big container ships coming out of China, uh, they're getting bigger. They're going to get a lot bigger, and they're not going to be able to go through the Panama Canal anymore. And if you want to have those ships come into your harbor, you're going to have to dig a bigger hole in the ground to get those ships to come in. Here comes the federal government in with a $40 million check to deepen your port facility so you can attract the global trade from China with those ships. Government handout. Boy, that gets tough, doesn't it? How would you respond to that? $40 million to deepen the port harbor and create 2,500 jobs. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? You're beating on the pinata too. Social Security, Medicare, I paid into that Social Security all my life. I deserve it, I earn it. Medicare, they lied to you and said they could pay for Medicare and all these promises they made to you. They can't do it. But by golly, don't cut that either, you see. That's where the real problem is in this country is you and I know we're on the wrong path, but we're not willing, nobody in this country is willing to bite the bullet. Period. And my philosophy, my theory is, and I'm an economist, so that means there's a 50% chance everything I say is wrong, all right? Right up front. <laughs> but you could have paid half a million to get Greenspan here, and he'd be easily that much wrong, too. And for a while, I thought you could get Bernanke here for maybe a thousand bucks, but they finally re-upped him for another term in office. I don't care who you listen to, these people in the national 
in the, not, not, not the national media, I'm talking about the people in the Treasury Department and the White House and the Federal Reserve, you can listen to them all day long and they can't tell you what's really going on. Because if they did, you'd be scared and you wouldn't do anything. So they come and tell you, I don't know about you, but every time I hear a Federal Reserve person talk, six months from now, GDP is going to be 3.5%. So we'll see. What do you think is going to happen between now and the end of the year that's going to make businessmen and women in this country want to hire anybody? Because Ben Bernanke said it's going to be 3.5%. Just ask, see the fun thing I like about talking to business people? I don't have to explain it to you. If this was a big audience with a bunch of people from outside of business, I'd say, find a small business person in this room and ask them why they won't hire, and they'll tell you why. All this government uncertainty and regulation is pathetic. It's embarrassing. And I've been telling people for the last three years, boy, was I stupid, because I was the only guy that had a little bit of optimism that our government would do the right thing. And people would come up to me and go, you know what, Bernanke, you're pretty good. Half your slides are right. And I'd say, you know, for an economist, that's a real compliment. But the only thing they disagreed with me about was not half my slides, it was one slide, it was the idea that maybe our government would do the right thing and start living within its means, and I would then tell people, if you're even thinking about buying gold, I would recommend you just take cocaine instead, because at least you'll feel good before it kills you. <laughs> and a lot of people used to laugh at that until I know half of you there go, hey, I just took a big load of that the other day. <laughs> Jim, do you hear that? I told you we shouldn't have bought gold. <laughs> gold is a commodity. You don't invest in commodities. You speculate in commodities. You hedge risk with commodities. Just go back and look at a price of gold. The last time it went to eight or 900 bucks because we lost confidence in our government. We thought they were a bunch of morons that couldn't do anything right and we were right at the time. The surprise, we brought an adult in. His name was Paul Volcker. He fixed the problem. And gold wasn't $900 an ounce, it was $360 an ounce for the next 16 years. If you're buying and owning gold now, that's what you're betting on. There is no adult that will come in, and you better hope he doesn't, because if the adult shows up in the room, gold and all these other commodities aren't going to look near as juicy as they have in the past. <coughs> I, one of the guys at the table said so I should mention this right now. It's not in my slides. One thing new that I've noticed is in the last week, I was in Canada uh, to go see the Stampede, the rodeo. That was kind of cool. I went to the mountains for a few days. I also opened up a bank account in Canada, by the way, so that I could get all of my money. I don't own any gold, so I'm not protected. But I just opened a bank account at the Bank of Montreal in Calgary so that if push comes to shove, these geniuses do enough more bad decisions <laughs> I'm going to start canceling all my CDs, taking my interest rate hit, and wiring that money out of the country as fast as I can before they shut the window. And you don't think that happens? Just look at your history books in 1932 when Franklin Roosevelt devalued our currency by 40% overnight, made you by law sell the gold to him at $20 an ounce, and then revalued it and sell it back to you at $35 an ounce. Made it punishable by penalties, heavy heavy money penalties if you don't sell your gold back, and then in addition to that, making you sell all your gold back to the government, he also shut the window on foreign currency. Same thing. <laughs> Executive orders. You don't need Congress. President. Boom. Happens tonight. Boom. Happens the next day. You can't own gold. You can't get your money out of the country. It's been done in the past, and so it's crazy. Can you believe I'm even talking about this? I mean, I know if you look at me, you go, well, first of all, he's an economist. That's pretty weird. Second thing, he's got a beard, so that's kind of weird. And he went to UT and he works at AM. This guy cannot be trusted at all. <laughs> I understand it. Now, my daughter went to Baylor, so I hook and gig him and sick him, all right? My dad went to Stanford, so I went every week somewhere. I don't, this speech was going to, I don't, I can't possibly go through this in 30 minutes because I want to take some questions. So, what I'm going to do, I don't need to explain this to you. That, who pays for government spending? Uncle Sam, there is no such thing, that's you. The Tooth Fairy, that's who I refer to as Ben Bernanke, printing money out of nowhere. Or Congress, none of those people pay for it. the stuff that they give you. That's how you get elected. You promise people you can give them stuff that you can't possibly pay for. That's our political model here. When you think about, do this too. When you talk to people and they talk about term limits, turn them around off of that. Term limits are meaningless we got to have spending caps in this country. 
you, you put a monkey into the into the pasture, or the, I don't know, into the banana field, wherever that is, he's going to steal every banana off the tree, all right? And whether you let him do that for four years or 40 years, they're going to do that. That's how you get reelected. You go get bananas off the tree and bring them back to your, your constituents. Term limits are meaningless in my mind. Spending caps is the key. We need a spending cap on federal spending at about 20 or 21 percent of GDP. Period. Just get people to start thinking. Don't clap. Don't clap. There'll be one person here that'll come up and say, "Will you run for office or run for president?" And I will tell you the same thing I've said for the last year and a half. I can't run for a federal office. I'm not qualified because I pay my income tax. Okay. But I'm telling you, spending cap is the key. It's like, look, okay, we're not, we, I don't care what monkeys are in the trees over here. It's just you have a limit to how many bananas. And you, once you, you consume all those bananas, you don't get any more. That's got to be the, that, in my mind, that's got to be the key. This whole thing about the debt ceiling is just getting you juiced up so you'll watch TV. I mean, it's just like, we're watching TV. I've never watched TV. The other night, I wanted to see what the weather was going to be. And I'm watching the Weather Channel, and it goes, heat advisory for, like, Grimes County. It's like, do I need somebody to tell me it's hot in the summer? I mean, what about that? Am I supposed to watch again to see if it's super heat advisory or something? I mean, they're just selling you stuff. This whole debt thing is just a total smoke and mirrors thing, because we're not going to default on our debt. It's just not going to happen. But I'm glad these people are holding this up for the American people and make it a crisis. That's good with me. Now let's have a little crisis here. Let's have a little tornado warning exercise where it kind of feels like a tornado is coming, but it really isn't just this time. Let's have a couple of these because the American people, you and I have to wake up and go, maybe I won't need to get as much out of Medicare as I thought I was going to. Maybe $43 trillion in the hole for Medicare might be a little too much to pay. $43 trillion, that's not my number, that's the trustees of Medicare. $43 trillion unfunded liability. The trustees for Social Security, $5 trillion, $6 trillion. I don't know what it is exactly. They said $5 trillion unfunded liability for Social Security. That means the money they promised you they can't pay. So $43 trillion over here that they say for, social, for Medicare and another five over here for Social Security what is that, $48 trillion they can't pay back on top of the $15 trillion they've already got, $14 trillion they already got in debt? That's $63 trillion. They can't possibly pay that. 